Hey guys, my name is Nikos and welcome back to the channel. Lethal Company is the first early access game that's worth your money. Well, aside from one. The little co-op survival game has been going absolutely viral as it exploded onto the Steam store and outsold Call of Duty on Steam, made only by a solo developer. For those of you who haven't played this co-op survival horror game, check it out, it's worth 10 bucks. Second act Oh fuck! Yeah, back up! Yeah! Yeah! Lethal Company is a beautiful game in that it makes you feel helpless in ways that I can't really explain. There isn't a moment in this game where you don't feel absolutely suffocated by dread. In-game, you are a low-level employee that works for the company in a spacefaring civilization. Basically, you work for Space Amazon. Every three days, you and your friends must scavenge scrap from numerous abandoned moons before voyaging back to your nearest fulfillment center to drop off your haul and cash your check. This cycle repeats, with the value requirement of loot you need to haul back to the company increasing with each subsequent quota. And that's it. That's the whole game. There's nothing else to see here. Guys, we gotta get out of here. What the hell is that? Oh! It's looking at me! Oh, that's a spider. <laughs> oh, oh, time to go. Oh, fuck! Benji, are you okay? Oh, fuck! Oh, good God! Yeah. <laughs> A lot of this game is shrouded in mystery. The lore and story specifics of this game are very vague, and what little details that can be found in game don't yield much helpful information. Scraping past the surface of your space janitor job uncovers more questions than answers. The beings you encounter in the worlds of Lethal Company, the company that everyone works for, and even the moons themselves oftentimes defy explanation. And that's what I'm here to do. Explain not just the game itself, but also the lore and story. What follows in this video is spoilers for the data logs, bestiary entries, and moons of Lethal Company. If you've played the game and want to know more, or just want to continue with the video anyway, be my guest. I do recommend you play the game first yourself if you haven't, but either way, I think it's safe to begin with... The reason this game is going viral right now is because of what you can find lurking in the halls of the colonies and on the surfaces of these desolate moons. There are numerous species of alien creatures that have made their home out of what humanity left behind. Some of these creatures are actually friendly. Then there's some threats that are kind of minimal, such as the slimes, which creep along the floor at slow speeds to try to lick your ankles, but not in a friendly way. Oh, you heard it. I think you're just making it angry. Oh, shit. Oh, well, I'm out of here. Then there's... What was that? <gasps> Time to leave. Time Nick, to leave. leave me alone. I'm not. Leave I'm not leaving you alone. We yeah. One of the bedrock mechanics in Lethal Company is the immersive VoIP. Your voice only travels so far in Lethal Company, and when indoors, voices echo down the halls. Set colonies. Oh, dude, the echo. Ball. This means your friends can only hear you when you are close enough to them. You can also buy a radio to talk with your friends at long distance, but much like the flashlights that you can buy in this game, they have limited battery and take up a whole inventory slot. But your friends aren't the only ones that can hear you. Many of the hostile entities in this game can hear you as well. One of the hostile creatures built solely around the voice mechanic are the blind dogs. They are incredibly violent but can only attack something they hear. If you drop a heavy piece of machinery, such as an engine you're trying to loot, they will begin approaching where they heard it. If you speak, scream, or even breathe too loudly, they will hear it. If someone calls you over the walkie-talkie, they will even hear that from your pocket, so it's smart to keep it switched off when not in use. 
Blind dogs effectively sever the most important piece of team play when nearby, crushing all communication and forcing crewmates to pantomime and dance emote to each other to communicate. What makes things worse with the enemies that can hear you is that many of the more valuable pieces of loot make noise. Why does the company need chattering teeth toys and rubber duckies more than an engine? It's a good question, but we're actually going to be coming back to this one later. So yeah, it's very easy to die while getting your job done in Lethal Company, hence the name. Pretty much every hostile creature in Lethal Company is much stronger than the player. You can find stop signs and buy shovels to bash in some of the littler foes, but they will likely still kill you unless you play smart. Even the bees in this game have hands. But who can resist the price tag on a fresh get in, beehive? Get in, get in, get in, get in. No! Take off, take off now! Take off! Sweet, sweet quota. The bees themselves are known as circuit bees and seem to have some sort of electrical power that courses through their swarms to deal damage to would-be attackers, or beehive thieves. The wildlife on these moons exhibit a surprising amount of variety for an early access game. The moons sort of cobbled together an alien ecosystem that, although these colonies were once human, your kind are clearly no longer welcome here. The world building and lore of this game is fascinating. It has you delving deeper into these facilities to discover what new horrors await you, especially as some of those entities are rarer than others. Scanning the entities unlocks log entries in the ship's computer that elaborate deeper into these monsters and their habits and behaviors. Some of them even have no information in the ship's computer, making them all the more unexplainable and alien. One creature that has become synonymous with the game is the Bracken, known better as the Flower Man. Flower Man lurks the halls, stalking players and waiting for them to turn their back before rushing them and snapping their neck from behind. Paranoid players will be kept up at night by these shy guys. Checking your back on moons where Flower Man is present is sometimes essential for survival. Lore-wise, I don't know where these things learn to snap necks, or why they exist. I don't know how they happen to understand human physiology, more so what they are. All this goes unanswered by the game, adding to the mystery and the intrigue of how this complicated ecosystem functions. Another entity that makes very little sense are the coil heads. These things are seemingly man-made and resemble a sort of spring-headed mannequin. When they spot a player, they will rush them at Mach 10 until stared at. They cannot move or attack when stared at, a trope already seen a million times over the Weeping Angels and some of the SCP creatures, but are... <laughs> like what? Who made these things? They're theorized to be weapons of war, perhaps chemical weapons as they blow your head off when they catch you slipping. Even stranger is that they replace your whole head with a spring. This makes me wonder if they don't like people without springs for necks. Or bobbleheads, I guess. Or if they were built to create more duplicates of each other. Either way, it boggles my mind. Back to the alien wildlife are the numerous insects and arachnids. Oversized bunker spiders have turned the human structures into their own domiciles, throwing out webs to catch prey. Um, guys? Yeah? I'm in a precarious spot. <laughs> uh, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> then there's the snare fleas, more affectionately known as the face huggers, who suffocate crewmates by wrapping around their heads. Uh, New creature. What did we find? Oh, it's a face hugger! Run, 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 run! It's a head crab, dude. Yeah. Ah! He's after me! He wants my face! These two are some of the only creatures who can be killed by players, usually with a shovel. Another insect that is quite harmless in Lethal Company are the hoarding bugs, or as my friends and I call them, the cuddle bugs, who will only generally attack you when you pick up loot near them. Generally. One actually charged me for no reason, because I stuck around it too long, so... Try to keep your distance with everything in this game. Then there are the spore lizards, which are generally unthreatening, just keep away from them. They like to open their mouth and look scary, but they actually don't mean any harm unless you corner them. And these guys I always get mixed up with the haves, or thumpers as the community sometimes calls them. These guys are actually dangerous. They are very fast and tend to kill players quickly. I've tried picking fights with them with a shovel. It didn't end well. I don't recommend it. I don't know where to. 
Go ahead, run. I got aggro. He's coming! Run away! You can always know they're nearby if you listen for that distinct sound of sort of like two footsteps followed by a dragging sound nearby. Now one quirk about these thumpers is that they have absolutely no hearing, and the reason they kind of drag is because According to lore, they have to eat their bottom legs to escape their eggs when hatching. Yeah, pretty bizarre. The best tips for survival against these guys is going around corners as it can only really move quickly in a straight line and has trouble around bins. Then we move on to another entity that has absolutely no hearing, and those are the forest keepers. These towering entities lurk the moons, and typically the forests around these moons. And the thing about these giants is you will hear them coming, especially if they're charging you, as the footsteps get louder and louder and faster and faster. While these giants have absolutely no hearing, they can see from long distances. The best tips for survival are hide from them and sneak around trees, typically. Try to block their line of sight between you and them. He's after us. Run. Also, they can't fit into your ship, so if you hide in the ship in the very back of it, they can't get you. Then we move on to perhaps the hardest entity to scan, and that is the Earth Leviathan. These are giant sandworms that kind of harken back to Dune that can be found on the desert maps of this game. Run, run, run. You will know an Earth Leviathan is moving into attack as you feel the ground underneath you rumbling and see black flakes rising from the soil. The best way to survive these guys is to turn around and sprint in the opposite direction at full speed, so try to drop everything heavy you got on you. Canonically, it is not known if any of them have actually been captured, so their biology is mostly unknown. The only thing that is known is that they are quite massive as they leave behind giant, impressive excavations. And finally, we end with the baboon hawk. These are large bird-like entities that often travel in groups or packs. They will only attack the player if they outnumber them or equal them in numbers, but sometimes I've seen them just attack us for no reason, so try to keep your distance from them. They don't usually attack you, but one interesting thing that adds to the ecosystems in this game is their interaction with the blind dogs. They will actually get into battles with eyeless dogs, which is incredibly useful for the players if they happen to be outside the shuttle in the later hours, as they can use that attack as a chance of an escape. There are eight moons to visit in Lethal Company, but much of the interior sections in game are shuffled by a random seed, allowing for constant replayability and inducing confusion for even seasoned players as no two runs are identical. The crew arrives on a moon's surface early in the morning, only to have limited time to loot as much as their four inventory slots can carry before nightfall. As time ticks on, enemy spawn rate begins to skyrocket in and out of the facility turning a perfectly peaceful moon into a horrifying, nightmarish hellscape. What makes things more interesting, and by that I mean painful, is the weather system in the game. Storms roll in, thunder, lightning, blizzards, and more. During a thunderstorm, if you have anything metallic on your person, be it a large axle, or even a tiny key, you will get Benjamin Franklin into the Shadow Realm within seconds. Drop your stuff, drop your stuff, drop your stuff, drop your stuff. Why? What happened? Lightning? Yep, lightning killed him. By the way, you stay at the ship. Why? You need eyes? No, I need someone alive. You got it. Oh, f oh, oh. <laughs> oh no! So much about the alive! The moons occasionally flood as well, and blizzards make navigation next to impossible on the frozen moons. And then there are eclipses. Alright, beam me in there. Wish me luck. Tell- <gasps> Eclipses increase enemy spawn rates significantly, where creatures that normally come out later in the day are already out on the prowl as soon as your ship touches down.
Within the facilities are mixes of industrial steel and catwalks that meld into mush, making it all too easy to become lost in these decaying structures. Some catwalks have even collapsed, forcing all or nothing parkour leaps that only make this game twice as stressful, especially when you're being chased. Well, I'm gonna jump with the apparatus so you guys can see the way. Oh no! No! He's dead. No! Oh, no! We gotta get out of here. Occasionally in the frozen moons, the facility is replaced by a Victorian era mansion of sorts. Oh, well, I don't like this one. No, this is, this is creepy. creepy. Without a flashlight, the indoor sections of these moons are heart racing, as anything could be lurking behind the corridors. Auto turrets and landmines occasionally fill these forlorn walkways, providing yet another threat for the scavenger teams. The setting of this game is oppressively hopeless and bleak. Make sure to keep your flashlights charged. A few of the moons are even more challenging than the rest. The airfare costs extra to these moons, but while the hostile wildlife is numerous, the loot in these stations are far more valuable. Just learn from us and don't travel to them during treacherous weather conditions. A subtle touch that wraps it all together is the sound design on these moons. It's impressive that much of the sound effects are open source, considering how effectively they've been utilized to make me sweat bullets. Footsteps echo down halls, rusting machinery squeaks, one thing that makes me nearly lose bodily fluids is the sound I heard of a jumbo spider skittering above me. It, nah, bro. <laughs> The intense quiet felt in these halls is interrupted only by some of the most horrifying and unnerving stuff. I can't stress enough how anxious these facilities make me. Even coming across an empty office room is unnerving. Especially because this is where the flower man spawns and drags his victims. To make things more interesting is the apparatus, the soft, glowing heart of each facility on each moon. When unhooked, all power to the facility is cut. The few lights that remain active in these halls go dark and enemy spawn rates accelerate. Extracting with the apparatus feels like the last helicopter out of a... Well, March. Or Vow. Up to you. It's intense. The world building of Lethal Company paints a rather depressing one at best. Everything has the potential to kill you, as you and your friends scrape together measly garbage to sell for meager wages. Lethal Company's moons build an atmosphere of unmatched, hopeless despair. I have no idea why I love playing this game so much. Being a space garbage man is tough, but the world becomes more hopeless when you witness the company building and begin to understand its motivations and history. This all-powerful, overwhelming company has spread its reach far into space as it sends groups of scavengers to abandoned human colonies across numerous derelict moons that litter the cosmos. Searching for scrap can be a challenging task in the maze-like catacombs of these colonies, so very often you will find yourself spending your hard-earned cash on supplies bought straight from the company you work for. Okay, I got three. Like I said, the company is basically Space Amazon. Every resource you have is straight from the company you work for. An endless cycle of employment. Not to mention the company also won't let you leave. Situated on an ocean moon, the drab corporate building towers into the stormy clouds above and the murky depths below. A featureless, concrete monolith, complete with a landing pad and a mile-long platform dwarfs the player, a metaphor for the chokehold the company has over its employees. The store pod jingle feels like the company is putting on the fakest robotic happy face to please humans in a way it fails to understand how to do. Oh yeah, let's go. Um, I got one. You and your coworkers are the only human thing here. Especially once you meet who's behind the loot drop-off counter. Bells. See, look, he's just coming to look for more loot. Just ring it a few more times. Oh good gosh! Even selling your scrap is risky, as you must ring the bell enough for Space Bezos to respond, but must back away if he wakes up grumpy, as he'll take you as loot as well. The ship you pilot in-game is an autopilot ship, meaning all the control lever does for the player is voyage to a moon of choice, land on it, or take off from it. 
You are essentially trapped on the ship by the company. Around the ship you can find numerous clues to the status of the world, or galaxy I should say, and society as humanity has graced the stars. There's a propaganda poster near the ship controls that talks about a current food conservation effort. It is likely that a famine has stricken the cosmos, and that there could be an associated economic downturn alongside it. The technology on the ship is rather archaic too. The same computer, hard drives, and data remain from the late 60s as the computer was never swapped out for something more advanced, and much can be found within these aging tapes. The only human chronology in game is cataloged in Sigurd's logs. These logs reveal much about the previous crew of your ship, dated all the way back to 1968. The logs follow the story of four crewmates, Sigurd, Jess, Desmond, and Rich. I won't read each of these logs in full, but I will sum up each of them in detail. Sigurd left 12 logs in the computer that can be viewed from entering his name into the terminal, but these logs are only unlocked when players find tape recorders scattered across many of the moons. Not including the first log though, which is viewable from game start. Let's get into them. What follows is a summary of the logs that have been found in-game in Lethal Company as of November 2023. Sigurd's first log, dated back to August 22nd, 1968, already sets up that the calendar or timeline in Lethal Company does not follow our own, considering that the first moon landing in our reality occurred in 1972, years after this version of humanity, or whatever humanoid beings we play as, colonize the moons and planets of the Thistle Nebula and possibly other systems. Sigurd mentions that turnover rate at the company is enormous due to the high influx of worker fatalities. You don't say. Anyway, he notes his confusion that the company would want useless junk in his next log titled, Smells Here. He also explains his role on camera duty, which refers to a game-winning strategy where one player stays behind on the ship and watches over their fellow crewmates on cameras, opening security doors and disabling turrets for them to assist in their looting efforts. In the log Swing of Things, Desmond is revealed to be the computer wizard of the group, and Sigurd began hearing psychotic noises behind the company building walls. Next log, Shady. Sigurd notes how shady the company is, and how artificial voices guided him through the recruitment process over the phone. Sounds behind the wall. Sigurd hears screams alongside grinding sounds that remind him of what sounds like mixing spices in a pestle bowl. Screams. Sigurd places a call about an accident, likely a workplace fatality, and receives a reply from a robotic voice over the company phone that talked very fast, almost like it was used to having this conversation with employees. The voice over the phone assured Sigurd that a replacement was on the way. Sigurd notes that you can hear screams and voices through the walkie-talkie near the company building walls. Though this isn't able to be witnessed in game, my friends and I have tried. Nonsense. In the final log that has been found in game in Lethal Company, Sigurd explains that their newest crewmate, Lucas, is very afraid of his line of work. Desmond managed to trace the accident call with the company back to its origin. The call destination was spoofed. It was masked to look like it came from the company building, but instead it pinged from across the solar system. Sigurd contemplates some of the conversations he had through the walkie-talkie near the company building. What if there really is a big monster in the company building, like the voice told me on the walkie-talkie? They trapped it, and feed it to keep it tame. I just wanted a stupid job. You may have noticed we only talked about seven logs. That's because of the twelve, only seven have been identified in-game. We don't know how to find the other five. And the other five may not even be accessible at the moment. They seem to have been leaked on the web via data mining. But these logs do seem legitimate, as chronologically, they help explain some of the gaps in our timeline in Sigurd's story. If you don't want these unknown logs being spoiled, and have found the other seven but can't find these five, I would skip to the next section of the video, theories and putting the whole lore together, because this is certainly going to spoil some material that may be in the game in the future. Golden Planet Sigurd notes that one of the voices from beyond the company building walls told him that a world known as Golden Planet was real and wasn't hit by a meteor, but instead swallowed up by the beast and that both the planet and its inhabitants were in the beast being digested. The voice mentions that after being eaten, they forgot everything. 
When Sigurd told the voice it was behind the wall and could help him get out of the building, the voice panicked and began freaking out. Jess assured Sigurd that the golden planet wasn't real. This log is backed up by the already known log called Nonsense, which confirms that this conversation about the monster behind the wall consuming humans and salvage alike did happen. So that gives some legitimacy to this weird log that we have no idea about. Goodbye. Sigurd's team went on a routine scavenging operation. Sigurd struggled to open the door to the last room. He turned around after hearing a bone cracking noise, seeing that Rich was no longer there behind him. Sigurd knew a flower man snapped Rich's neck. Sigurd's team was mortified, looking on with blank expressions. He tried to convince them to help him retrieve Rich's body, but to no luck. His team was set out to leave and would even leave Sigurd behind too. A log that has been found in-game, Screams, confirms this accident happened. The untimely demise of Rich prompted Sigurd's call to the company, Idea. Desmond has a plan to trace the call back from the company building, while Rich's replacement is announced to arrive soon. Desmond began using the terminal far more often here, which was likely spurred by the loss of Rich. Hiding. Sigurd began dreaming that the beast broke out of the company building and referred to the beast as simply the company. Similar to the voices behind the wall, Sigurd began forgetting his past. He forgot his shuttle ride to the company building for recruitment and even forgot saying goodbye to his father. And now, for the final log, Desmond. The wiki says it was recorded on October 15th, though the log itself dates it as October 3rd. Weird discrepancy, but in-game, if you type Desmond into the terminal, it yields a unique error message that the data was either overwritten or otherwise. Typing in Jess and Rich yields no results, so it is likely that entering Desmond into the terminal in future updates may reveal this log. Desmond, the computer whiz, recorded this log. He starts by saying he encrypted the log to keep it hidden, and doesn't want it found. We're supposed to think it's all just a transaction, but our real job is keeping an incredible terror fed. How long until its fullness ends, and its hunger is insatiable? Desmond theorizes that maybe the monster itself has to do with all these desolate moons. He wishes the reader a good day and night, and ends it as saying, what else is there for them to do? Is it the beehive yep. or his body? His body. His body's out there. Oh, the bees left. I have no idea where it's at. Help point me out on camera. It's right on the ground over there, but I see it. Oh, the bees are coming for me. The bees, not the bees. Close the door. I'm coming, I'm coming. Please. Open the door, open up. Open the door. And handle it. it. Boom. Boom. Slam oh, dunk. there's a big, we're going. We are leaving. We are Dog. leaving. With the logs, moons, and creatures all fully understood, we can now piece together a complete story for this mysterious indie gym. I won't be including the secret logs into this part of the lore, as we aren't sure if part of them, or all of them, are meant to be part of the story, or could just be cut content, so I won't be including them in this lore summary for now. Lethal Company tells the story of a society spread amongst the stars before the early 1900s, before encountering a Lovecraftian horror. This space monster posed enough of a threat to our player's species, who I will refer to as humans from here on out, to the point to where they locked up this beast in a massive concrete structure. The company was founded, and it masquerades as a salvaging operation that sends workers on life-threatening missions to moons once populated by humans, now abandoned and overrun by alien wildlife. I believe a war or armed conflict of some kind was fought between human factions at some point, or maybe between humans and some of the aliens, as there's not a lot of explanation for all the landmines and machine gun turrets that fill these facilities. Also, coil heads are likely a sort of makeshift war robot, but this is just speculation on my end, of course. Nevertheless, in the late 1960s, Sigurd and his team began working for the company, and with fate unknown, they would eventually be replaced by you and your fellow employees to continue the endless mission of keeping the locked up beast fed and satiated. It's probably like a sort of planet-eating cosmic super horror, which would explain why random space junk keeps it satisfied. This is all set against a worsening food shortage, and likely an economic downturn in human space. As far as we know, this is the complete story for Lethal Company, aside from my little speculation bit. Now those of you more seasoned players might have noticed I left out two creatures, because they defy explanation completely. These include the Jester and the Ghost Girl. 
And while Sigurd has a log on the Jester, it's not at all filled out. It is unknown what this weird being is. And I haven't personally encountered it in-game. I've only seen videos of it. As for the Ghost Girl, I haven't encountered it either. I hear it's probably the most terrifying thing in-game. And you can't even scan it. So there is no official lore. It is completely up to speculation what the Ghost Girl is. So happy ghost hunting. And that's where we leave off. Already, this early access game has a rich universe that sparks theories and begs for answers. It's also early access and very funny because of it. <laughs> can, can I get out? Have a fun in here. Too bad you're grounded. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's got a stop sign! A heartless corporation focused on satiating an intergalactic horror is a story I didn't expect from this game. I have expected it to be a commentary on the consequences of unchecked capitalism and greed, but nonetheless, I enjoy this game a lot, and I recommend that you check it out if you want to have a great time with your friends. It's scary, it's hilarious, and if you want, you can even play it solo if you're feeling insane. It is freaky alone. The threats layers of tension, and unsettling atmosphere, painted by dark halls and eerie sound design, make this VoIP-focused team game an immersive experience. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like it, subscribe to the channel, and comment your thoughts below. As always, I'll see you on the next one.